Our next speaker, I think, is one of the most exciting emerging leaders in this country right now. Celeste Little is an Arundel woman living in Melbourne. She is the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Indigenous Organiser for the National Tertiary Education Union, as well as a freelance opinion writer, social commentator and public speaker. She's an enthusiastic solo traveller and, like me, detests stupid rules and regulations. Her writings regularly appear in a range of publications, including The Guardian and Daily Life, but if you want to read more about her and the ones that are unsanitised, you can read her blog, which is Rantings of an Aboriginal Feminist. It's an amazing blog. We were so excited when Celeste agreed to speak to this conference. As she says herself, the experiences of Aboriginal women are often drowned out. It's rare that Aboriginal women are seen as experts. CIC is all about giving voices to people that are not heard or not heard enough of. Please welcome Celeste. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. This land was never ceded, a treaty has yet to be negotiated, and until that unfinished business is seen to, Australia will never come, as an, come of age as a nation. This I truly believe. I would also like to introduce myself as an Arunda woman, as per um, cultural protocol. My family's traditional lands on my father's side are around the Alice Springs region, and my immediate families up there are the Littles, of course, of which there are numerous thousand, and the Perkinses. On my mother's side, they're all pretty much working class Clifton Hillborn Collingwood supporters. I myself was born in Canberra and a good portion of my formative years up there was spent hanging around with extended family from both sides of um, the family, but particularly Dad's side, for a number of them were working and living in Canberra at that time in the public service. So I spent a lot of my childhood years going to land rights rallies. We moved to Melbourne in 1992 and following high school in the outer southeastern beachside suburbs, I went on to La Trobe University where I had a most unconventional time, initially being a geology major, then eventually um, ending up with a first class honours degree in theatre and drama. <laughs> following my graduation, I worked for many years in Indigenous student support at both Victorian College of the Arts and the University of Melbourne. It was while I was there that I became involved in union activities and eventually that led me to my current role as the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organiser for the NTEU. My career in writing has been equally non-traditional. I started my blog Rantings of an Aboriginal Feminist nearly four years ago, partially as a way of venting some frustrations and claiming a space for Indigenous feminist writing and partly to channel some ideas that I was exploring. Within six weeks, one of my pieces was picked up for publication. Since then, the requests have been pretty much non-stop. When I've been on panels about writing and been asked the inevitable question by an aspiring writer, how do I get my stuff published? My usual answer is, I have utterly no idea. Uh, it still, to this day, surprises, pe surprises me that people read and engage my work, and I can only put it down to being at the right in the right place at the right time. I started rantings just as some new online news sources were starting up in this country, and they picked it up. To truly begin today, though, I wanted to take a slight detour. I've very recently returned from a holiday in Germany, and I'm telling everyone who's interested. Um, but a trip, um, which it is a trip that which I had waited nearly two decades to take. Um, it's long been my dream destination. Indeed, my interest in Germany um, goes back to about grade six when I learned the language in primary school and became fascinated with the sounds and patterns of it. 
This fascination grew when I was at university and one of my favourite lecturers introduced me to the works of Bertolt Brecht and the Berliner Ensemble. Finally, over the summer break, after years of talking about it, I booked myself a ticket and actually went. The three weeks I spent there, exploring the cities, travelling the countryside and eating an incredible amount of food, were pretty amazing. Of course, the minute I landed back in Melbourne, I felt that post-holiday deflation everyone feels. Back to the routine, back to the writing, back to the office. And all last week, I was struggling with jet lag. It's a most curious sensation. The first day back in the office, I started to nod off at the desk at about 11 a.m. because my body thought it was 3 a.m. Uh, at the time. Each day, that sensation kicked in a little later. So the next day, it was around lunchtime when I hit the wall, and then 3 p.m. and so forth. That game of catch-up only really finished over the weekend, and now I feel I can almost function like a human being. On pondering this, I thought that jet lag was actually quite a good analogy for this talk. The phenomenon of it being the time right now, yet we are constantly waiting for all the mechanisms to catch up. This is often how I feel when, we are, when I think about the state of play for Aboriginal people, for women, and in particular, the intersection that makes up the experiences of Aboriginal women. We are ready, it is time, yet we are continually waiting for the rest of the country to catch up. And like with jet lag, we get some weird shifts in focus. We compromise because the energy just isn't going to get us to where we want it to at this point in time. We stumble because we are not quite at peak coordination at this point. We fall asleep on the job. So yes, as an activist in this, at this point in time, and one who is particularly interested in the issues of women and Aboriginal people, I get somewhat frustrated because I think that so many of the things that we seek are well overdue, yet we are continually waiting for people, for the country to catch up, for people to see these things as worthy and just, for people to realise that actually what is good for us is going to end up benefiting everyone who lives in this country in the long run, and that most of that lag is due to fear rather than logic. I say this because I remember being a frustrated teenager in my outer suburban Melbourne high school back in the 1990s, fresh from the political movements of the 1980s Canberra. I remember being 16 years old and changing my title to Ms because even back then I felt that my worth of a, as a human being should not be determined by whether a man has claimed me as his possession or not. I remember laughing at some kid on the, on the sports oval who told me, go back to your own country. <laughs> Happened more than once. <laughs> I remember being the target of bullying, of rumours, of harassment and of, nas and of nasty playgr uh, playground politicking because I didn't quite manage to be physically acceptable at the time. Whether that was because I was a little bit too brown, or I had short hair, or teenage awkwardness, or whinged about having to wear the uniform dress was up for debate. I believe it was a combination of all of this. In an area of Melbourne which was rather monocultural, in a school which reflected that lack of diversity, I managed to stick out like a sore thumb for, for all of it. And having a willful and stubborn nature really didn't help matters for me. So experiencing this racism and sexism was a normal part of my growing up experience. And it wasn't limited to the school grounds. I'd feel this same pressure within family and community as well, and there seemed to be that same opportunity to contravene the expectations placed upon me. I often say that it was the continual limitations I felt placed upon me as a young person, both as a girl child and as an, and as an Aboriginal person, which led me to, um, sorry, which, which were what led me to staunchly claim both of them. Knowing that one false action I did could give all Aboriginal people a bad name, or that I wasn't being ladylike, led to an active rebellion. For you have two choices at that point. When continually held to these sorts of standards, when knowing you could, um, Sorry, when also knowing that you could damn an entire group of people um, to hell through your own actions, you either adhere or rebel. And though there were some tentative uh, attempts to adhere in the beginning, 
There are only so many racist and sexist jokes one person can endure before they realise there is utterly no point to it. So this is um, why you see what you see before you today. I'm a proud woman, I'm a proud Arunda person, and the fact that I have ties in this landmass that go back 4,000 generations is amazing. I'm a proud lefty and I feel, and I feel utterly no sh um, shame um, about not blending in. And at least in my own world, I'm self-determined. My focus of today is the importance of listening to the voices of Aboriginal women. And I would like to begin this with a recent experience I've had in my life of writing and advocacy. Some of you in the audience will be aware of this story. So please bear with me while I fill in the gaps for others. This year, I was incredibly privileged to be asked to deliver the keynote address for the Queen Victoria Women's Centre International Women's Day function. In constructing my speech, I drew, on a lot of, um, I drew a lot on my development as an activist in Aboriginal rights, feminism and unionism. I read out two um, poems of Aboriginal women who had inspired me infinitely, and one of those was Lisa Belair, who they've got a ph photographic exhibition of her works currently at the Curry Heritage Trust, and I recommend everyone go and look at them. I made a variety of arguments throughout this speech. One argument I made was around the concept of intersectionality and how, due to the fact that I came at the discussion from a number of marginalised perspectives, it's a label that I've gained, but not one that I'm necessarily comfortable with. Why is this? Well, because I've witnessed the concept of intersectionality um, starting to lack depth and indeed becoming synonymous with the idea of choice feminism rather than deep structural analysis. In my view, intersectionality should always be about the liberation of those who, through the intersection of multiple social marginalisations, are the most vulnerable in society. When you liberate those people, everyone else in society benefits. To illustrate my point, I drew on the Northern Territory intervention. I argued that while Aboriginal women were continually used as justification for this intervention, with politicians using the rates of abuse these women had suffered as a reason to remove any sort of autonomy from um, entire towns of people, not once did I see the views of an Aboriginal woman living under these circumstances represented. People were talking for them, around them, and in their alleged best interests, yet were never letting them speak. And at the end of the day, the women that the government was supposed to be protecting were left without any avenue for recourse at all. They couldn't argue against their circumstances. Not only were their spending rights dictated to them, but the rates of domestic and family violence actually rose during the first couple of years of the intervention. My reason for using this example was simple. Of the women in society, these are the very women I feel feminists should be working with with a view to achieving their liberation. By virtue of gender, race and class, these women are Australia's most vulnerable and they have the least capacity to fight against the injustices inflicted upon them. It was this argument which led news publication New Matilda to select a picture of Aboriginal women painted up for ceremony while engaged in protest action against the intervention to accompany my speech when they decided to publish it. It was fitting that the women I identified who stood to gain the most from the feminist movement be the ones who accompanied my words. And that's when all hell broke loose. I posted a copy of my speech on my Facebook page and copped my first 24-hour ban from Facebook because Facebook deemed the image which accompanied my speech to be pornographic. I was then banned again from Facebook um, within three hours of being reinstated for sharing an article about my banning due to that image. Indeed, all up, I managed to be banned seven times just for sharing coverage. Thank you. <laughs> Officially, I say four, but it was seven because I have three accounts that run my page. <laughs> but yeah, it was over and over again for sharing the speech, for sharing a petition about the banning due to that image, for sharing news coverage about the ban. <laughs> It was just over and over again. It was bad enough that women who were engaged in ceremony that is 
thousands of years old could ever be seen in this insulting way by Facebook. And therefore, women's culture was essentially being silenced. But 6,000 words of an Aboriginal feminist who was advocating precisely for women like these to be given the voice and the space they deserved went to miss too. Indeed, the media managed in their always unique way to turn the story into a case of Celeste shared a rude picture on Facebook, while neglecting that Aboriginal women in all their proud cultural glory had not only been mindlessly censored, but the words of an Aboriginal woman had also been lost in the cacophony. If there was anything which was going to prove the multiple points I made within that speech, it was all of this. The irony was delicious. If frustrating, for every little gain that an Aboriginal woman makes in the social sphere, she, is pu she ends up being pushed back with gusto. This is the constant in, um, issue Aboriginal face. In a society which centralises the experiences of wealthy white men, there is little chance that our views will be heard. If they are, they, are, they will be perceived to be biased and marginal or even pornographic in ways that the um, voices of wealthy white men simply aren't. It additionally means that where those who are marginalised do make some ground, the ground they gain is usually indicative of their relative social status. So if white men are, at, sorry, wealthy white men are at the top of the strata, just below them um, on the next step with the next highest access to social status will be those who can tick at least one box in common with those at the top. In other words, in a white patriarchal world, both white women and black men will be perceived as having more rights and status than black women do. On one hand, politics of race comes into play, perceiving um, the voices of those of the same race as having a higher entitlement to space. And on the other, the politics of gender come into play, ensuring that men who are marginalised by race still manage to be preferenced ahead of women who are also marginalised by race. When I think about the way Aboriginal women are represented continually in this country, it would be fair to say that these representations reflect the strata. Over and over again, we, saw, we see Aboriginal women being spoken for, rather than them being given the space to speak for themselves. Take, for example, the representations we see on television. If ever we needed proof that the white middle class male is the social default, we could just switch on our TV. It's pretty shocking that in 2016, we are still having discussions on how ethnic diversity on television is actually a good thing and how getting a gig when your first name is Mustafa is highly unlikely. To add to this, while it has been absolutely great to see the growth of things such as NITV and to see dramatic representations such as those in Redfern now, these tend to be the exception rather than the rule. I can't just tune into the news to see an Aboriginal anchor woman. I'm fairly certain that Aboriginal people aren't going to be used to sell me toothpaste or headache tablets. And until this was pointed out to me by someone who had lived overseas for a number of years and seen how other countries do this, I didn't actually realise how glaring it was. If Aboriginal voices, and particularly Aboriginal women's voices, are removed at this incredibly superficial level of representation, just imagine how deep this phenomenon permeates the society. Earlier I brought up the Northern Territory intervention and how their voices were completely erased from this situation. If Aboriginal women in remote communities are experiencing violence at high rates, then shouldn't we be listening to the, these women when they are saying what they need? And unfortunately, this phenomenon is so embedded in Australian society that Aboriginal, I'm sorry, the phenomenon of Aboriginal women being painted as victims rather than knowledgeable people who could possibly um, hold the answers to many of the social ills, that a lot of people do just accept um, the stories. Last year, the image of abused Aboriginal women was invoked again by WA Premier um, Barnett in his justification for the potential forced closure of Aboriginal communities. Yet while he was doing this, a women's shelter in the Pilbara region, which has been set up by local women who were themselves survivors of family and domestic violence, and they did this in order to protect other women and children within their community, 
This shelter ended up facing closure because it lost government funding. The women themselves have been working to fix a social problem and using their own expertise for the betterment of their entire community and this vital community appropriate service was nearly lost. Every year since the federal apology to the stolen generations, we have had the tabling of the Closing the Gap report. And every year it seems to bring with it the bad news that the gap just doesn't really seem to be closing. We are told that there have been small gains in the life expectancy gap, yet the chronic health problems remain. Despite this, in the most recent funding round of the governmental um, Indigenous Advancement Strategy, it was, it was covered in the media that over two-thirds of the money for Indigenous programs went to non-Indigenous organisations and a good portion of these were granted before the funding round actually opened. It seems to be a constant feature of how Australian society at large sees Indigenous issues. Non-Indigenous people are experts on Indigenous issues due to their privilege of distance and their alleged non-bias. Meanwhile, Aboriginal people themselves apparently lack the ability to enact their own change for the better. It gets more complicated than this though. Where the voices of Aboriginal women do break through, they are often treated as if they don't belong here. It is poignant I'm discussing this now, for only yesterday my column went live looking at the extraordinary level of racism and sexism that Nova Paris was subjected to following the announcement of her retirement as the Northern Territory Senator for the Labor Party. It was claimed by a media commentator, I'm not naming them here, but if anyone wants to know exactly what I'm talking about, check out my article. It was claimed by a media commentator that her resignation fuels the stereotype that Aboriginal people go walk about and that Aboriginal people just don't see things through. It was also claimed by a former ALP national president and current Indigenous parliamentary advisor that Paris had let her team down, that her appointment as a captain's pick had been a mistake. Never mind that Nova Paris had served a full term of office as a territory-based senator, which is three years. Never mind the fact that Paris resigned for reasons which so many other white male politicians have resigned for over the years without any issue, that she needed to focus her attention on her family. Yet for some reason, the fact that she had done her job for the required time and to the best of her ability seemed to escape the notice of these men one of whom should have known a lot better since I'd wager he too has had the experience of the amount of additional pressure anyone who is Aboriginal and takes up um, public office feels. But this reaction was just the tip of the iceberg. Throughout her time as a senator, Paris received racist letters delivered to her home address. She received derogatory messages on social media channels. Just this weekend, she was viciously att attacked on her own Facebook page, and while it looks like the perpetrators of these, ser of these serious offences may be um, being served justice as we speak, it should be noted that the slurs of this individual only represent the most extreme of the online attacks that she endured. As someone who herself um, resides in public space, I know this only too well. Indeed, I tend to prefer dealing with those who try and silence me by resorting to extreme measures publicly because it's right out there and in the open and other people can see it happening. It's much easier to deal with this than it is to deal with the private messages received or the more subtle, subtle examples expressed publicly implying that I couldn't possibly know what I'm talking about for whatever reason. When thinking about Nova Paris's experience, is it any wonder that many Aboriginal women simply refuse to engage in public life and office? The world doesn't want us to speak and put our views forward. We apparently intrude if we do. So if our views are continually going to be seen as inferior or intrusions upon the status quo, where is the incentive to do this? For a number of years now, I have worked within the higher education sector, first as an Aboriginal liaison officer responsible for student recruitment, um, retention and support. And nowadays, my role is geared more towards um, Indigenous staff union membership and advocacy within the entire sector, as, as well as broader social justice issues. There is one thing that has really struck me, and it's a story that I feel 
um, people are not very aware of in this country. Do people know that when it comes to entering the higher education sector as students, Aboriginal women enrol at um, a rate double that of what Aboriginal men do? That they tend to also um, do so as mature age students and are therefore taking, family, taking care of family while also studying? What's more, are people aware that this trend of double the enrolment is one that has been going on for well over a decade? Aboriginal women have twice the number of qualifications that Aboriginal men do, yet on the rare occasion that when the mainstream community promotes Indigenous voices, it tends to look towards the voices of Aboriginal men more often than not due to the limitations of a patriarchal society. When it comes to staffing trends in Australian universities, this phenomenon is also reflected. Aboriginal women work in higher education at a rate double that of Aboriginal men. I am additionally proud to mention that Aboriginal women also take up union membership at a higher rate than our men, and therefore are reflective of the national trend um, in unions at this point in time, where the average unionist is actually an educated woman in a white collar industry, industry rather than that old stereotype of a blue collar man in a fluorescent vest. Though don't get me wrong, these men are incredibly important to the movement. Overall in the sector, Aboriginal staff make up about 1%, so clearly we are still significantly underrepresented and have a long way to go before we reach what a population parity rate would be. Yet universities remain elitist institutions which reflect the dominant culture in most circumstances. Therefore, even though we are twice as qualified as Aboriginal men, when you look to the higher levels of employment within the sector, that are open to Aboriginal people, you find that the majority of these higher level positions are held by men. And so the power strata I mentioned earlier continues to play out. We talk in this country about closing the education gap, yet while Aboriginal women, due to their higher levels of access and success in education, should be seen as the experts they are, with regard to how Aboriginal people in subsequent generations can navigate this system, it is rarely seen as the case. If I were to go back to the topic of violence, I again see a lot of missed opportunities. It is well documented that the rates of violence experienced by Aboriginal women are significantly higher than the rates experienced by other women in this country. One of the most horrific st um, statistics I have ever read was that Aboriginal women are 70 times more likely to be hospitalised for brain injury caused by domestic and family violence. 70 times. Yet when it comes to experiencing domestic violence in the first place, we are about 38 times more likely. We are also three times more likely to experience sexual violence. Yet more often than not, these figures are used one of two ways. As mentioned before, the first way seems to be um, used to justify the removal of our rights and the imposition of policy upon us. The second way it is used is of a peripheral concern, as an add-on to the overall statistics undertaken due to the significance of these numbers. The opportunity, I believe, is being missed is this. By seeing Aboriginal women as crucial to the discussion on violence against women, and enacting the recommendations which they put forward, we will not only reduce the rates of violence experienced by Aboriginal women, but we could also reduce the rates of violence experienced by all women. Understanding how issues such as disenfranchisement, poverty, colonisation and patriarchy contribute to these horrific numbers is crucial to understanding risk factors, social normalisations, triggers and so forth. Learning how Aboriginal women work within their communities to address violence is also crucial. It seems the approach is always that mainstream programs are tailored for the benefit of Indigenous women rather than mainstream people stand to learn from the experiences and practices of others. Yet by engaging in um, discussions of culture, dispossession, racism and so forth, you can gain a better appreciation for the impacts of structural oppression and the parallels that these stories can assist in understanding what might end up benefiting other women. It's interesting to me because I'm up here speaking about how people might, um, should listen to Aboriginal women as a broader topic, yet I feel I've barely touched the surface. 
If I were to summarise my overall view, it would be that the experiences of privileged white men are constantly centralised as the Australian experience. Those who have the most experience and who stand to benefit the most from um, progressive programs and policy are therefore continually silenced when they should, in fact, be treated as the experts they are. Indeed, I feel Australia is, is incredibly prone to this mindset because we continue to be a country which ignores its own history for the sake of promoting the tales of privileged white males. And to take history as the example, what this means is that everyone ends up losing because the mistruths are perpetuated, ignorance is perpetuated, and division is pe therefore perpetuated. It's because of this accepted social dynamic, the status quo is rarely challenged. And rather than being seen as defiant, strong, and proud human beings worthy of respect, a picture of Aboriginal women painted up for ceremony is seen as an offence. When I look around today, I see young Aboriginal women staunchly and unapologetically leading the charge. During the Stop the Force Closures rally last year, young Aboriginal women were front and centre, organising the rally, giving the speeches, and mustering the thousands of people out on Melbourne city streets, otherwise known as what, the selfish rabble. Young Aboriginal women are out there in the media shaping opinions, influencing mainstream and refusing to back down in the hope that their fight will lead to a better future for those who come after us. Young Aboriginal women have been front and centre in the push for, um, for a recognition of Indigenous sovereignty and the negotiation of treaties, for they know better than anyone else that simply adhering to the current situation of social power dynamics is not going to be equitable, nor will it get us anywhere. Aboriginal women are the future and their voices are crucial. So I'd like to issue a challenge to all people listening to me today. Conscience, consciously reframe your points of reference and start turning this dynamic on its head for the betterment of everyone. Aboriginal women are smart, we're survivors and we have knowledge to share with you. We've survived not only the ongoing process of colonisation but several millennia living in this landmass, so we are indeed experts. I challenge people to digest the diverse opinions of Aboriginal women to read our books, to listen to our news, to watch our television shows and to absorb our stories, not for the fringe pieces that they are always assumed to be. These stories are crucial as they not only contain better insight into this country and how it operates, they also contain clues on how this country can work for the betterment of us all. Aboriginal women's stories must take centre stage if we are looking for a brighter and healthier tomorrow in this country. Thank you.